So each of you has a knot in front of you. And the first question that I want to ask about that knot is, is it three colorable? Right? Does it have a three coloration? Um, but rather than taking the experimental approach that we took two weeks ago and just sort of, here's three markers, let's see what we can do. Um, what I want to do is figure out how to make that a systematic question, how to turn it into an algebra problem. That if we can solve that algebra problem, it will definitively tell us either it's impossible to three color this knot, however many times you try, um, or if it is possible, it'll not only tell us how, which is really cool, um, but it'll also give us a way to determine how many different ways that there would be to three color a knot. That's what I want us to win by the end of today. Uh, is is a, is a method for making that systematic. Is that kind of like what you want us to look at a little bit in the homework? Yes. Time, six months? Okay. Yep, 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 exactly. So, so here we go. Um, what we know up until this point, so here's a knot, um, and we want to turn this, the tricolorability or lack thereof of our knots, we want to turn it into an algebra problem. And as you might expect, the key to that process is the magic equation. which since we're talking about knots and we're talking about three colorations, that's the original magic equation, x plus y plus c is congruent to 0 mod 3. And that that equation needs to hold at each crossing. If and only if um, a tricoloration exists. So my knot is tricolorable if and only if I can get x plus y plus z to be congruent to 0 mod 3 at every single crossing. Um, and any different way in which I do that is going to give me a different three coloration uh, for this knot. So the knot that I have up here on the screen is a knot that has six arcs. And so in principle, I have six different things to assign colors to. Um, I have three colors to work with, 0, 1, and 2. So again, let's think of 0 as red, 1 as green, 2 as blue. But I'm going to give you the markers at the end of our process today instead of at the beginning. So all of my colors, x sub i, are going to belong to this set, i from 1 up to 6, uh, where each of those xi is the color of one of my six i's. Um, and since I have a diagram in alternating projection. That means that I also have six crossings, six arcs, six crossings. And at each crossing, this equation has to hold. So how we turn this into an algebra problem is we look at each crossing one at a time and come up with a magic equation at each of those crossings. So how I like to do it is call the crossings A, B, C, D, E, F, label them here in the diagram somehow. So maybe this crossing is crossing A, B, C, D. There's E, there's F. Ultimately, it should not matter which order we label our crossings. Right? It also should not matter which order we, uh, we label our arcs. Uh, so maybe I'll call this arc here, I'll call this one X1. Um, and then maybe this little, maybe this arc over here on this side is arc x2. This next arc over here is x3. This arc here in the middle is x4. Arc on the top is x5. Uh, and that leaves x6 for this one down here. So I just assign a name and an, an xi to each of my arcs, um, a name to each of my crossings. And then at each crossing, I just need to write down the magic equation that needs to be satisfied where the roles of x, y, and z are the only things that differ from crossing to crossing. Uh, in the formulation that we used a little bit ago, the role of y was played by the overstrand at those crossings, and the roles of x and z were played by the understrands. So all we have to do to determine the magic equation at each crossing, start with crossing A, for example, is decide which are my x, y, and z. x and z are my unders, so here at crossing A, x and z are going to be x1 and x2. And my over is x5 for this particular crossing. Since in the magic equation, the three of those are symmetric, it doesn't matter which one is x, y, or z when we're just adding the three of them together anyway. We don't even have to worry about which ones are over and which ones are under. 
All we have to do in this process is just identify what are the three arcs that come together. Add those three together, set it congruent to zero mod three. That gives me the magic equation at those crossings. So at crossing A, it's arcs one, two, and five. Add those, congruent to zero mod three. That's putting space easy. there on purpose. I am putting space there on purpose, <laughs> yes. Yep, absolutely. Then all I have to do is the same thing for all the rest of my crossings. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna burn through that real quick. Um, at B, I have strands two, four, and five. At C, I have four, five, and six. Like term together. columns? Yes, yep, vertical method. Set yourself up for a little bit easier time here in a minute. Congruent to zero, congruent to zero. Uh, crossing D, I've got one, three, and four. Three and four. At crossing E, I've got three, six, and one. And at crossing F, I have six, two, and three. I'm a little bit skew on my columns, but I'm gonna have to live with that. I will live with the consequences of my skewness. Um, so one of the things that, well, maybe I'm not gonna notice this. Let me ask you to notice. Um, what do you notice about this, what I have now is a system of six equations in six variables. What do you notice about this system um, that gives us a kind of a, a hint to, you know, at least whether or not it's, it's the right description uh, of this knot? Yes, so each arc appears three times, mm -hmm. and also in each row, there's, three. there's only oh. three, right? So every equation has three non-zero coefficients in it, and every arc appears in exactly three of the equations. Um, which, by the way, because we have an alternating projection, um, the fact that each arc appears three times is just an indication that each arc is incident at only three crossings. It's original crossing, where it is an understrand, the next crossing, the only one in which it is an overstrand, and then it's terminal crossing, the one where it becomes an understrand again. Right? So the fact that we had an alternating projection is what tells us that every arc is going to appear three times. And because our magic equation always holds at a crossing, and at a crossing, three arcs are incident by definition. That's why we have three coefficients in each row. So three ones in each row for coefficients, and also three ones in each column uh, for each arc. Um, the right-hand sides are always zero, because that's our magic equation. Um, and these now need to be congruent to zero mod three. Um, so all we need to do now, all we need to do now, is figure out whether this system of six equations and six unknowns has solutions. And if it does have a solution, how many solutions does it have? Um, so this becomes not just an algebra problem, it becomes a linear algebra problem. Um, but it becomes a linear algebra problem of kind of an unfamiliar type for us. We're used to doing linear algebra where we have equal signs here, not congruence mod three signs. So when we do the linear algebra that we have to do today, we have to be doing it using arithmetic in the integers mod three. Um, so that's gonna be the degree of difficulty for us uh, today. Uh, and from time to time, we'll also find it useful to use technology. So you have your devices uh, today that are, that are gonna be capable of doing this. Um, once we have the system, we can code it into a computer and find out what its solutions are. Um, but I want for us to do the arithmetic by hand just once or twice uh, to get a feel for how it works. Um, and then afterwards, we can, we can use the technology for it. So in linear algebra, how would you approach solving a six by six system or you know any system. let's turn it into right let's let's turn it into matrix formalism so for that we would just replace all these equations with just their coefficients of variables because that's all that matters because they're linear equations the form of the rest of it has to follow and if I do that I end up with this six by six it's matrix it's a bunch of ones and zeros exactly um, so I'm gonna get ones three ones in each row. So in fact, all the row sums of this matrix are gonna be the same, they're gonna be three. And the column sums of this matrix are also all gonna be the same, they're gonna be threes. I'm really quickly running out of space here. One, three, and four. One, three, and six. Uh, and I don't have room for my last row here. 
So the matrix that we would be using to investigate the consistency solutions of this linear system uh, would look like this, with zeros everywhere that I left a blank. So I'll sort of fill in the rest of these zeros while I'm talking. And so once we have this matrix written down, we would also, in principle, if this were any old linear algebra problem, we would include these right-hand sides of this equation uh, on the other side of a, an augmentation bar, is what we use typically in linear algebra. So this would be an augmented matrix um, that we could then, in principle, use to determine the, the solutions for this system. OK, um, how? So how do we get from here to there? Uh, what do we want to do with this matrix uh, in order to, to figure out whether it has the solutions that we're looking for? Reduced row echelon, Reduced row echelon form. So what we need to do, yeah, so this is a throwback. So I, I, I wrote in my, in my lecture notes for today, let's spend some time reviewing reduced row echelon form. Um, so yeah, cal well, calculator is how you would do it, yeah. you know, usually because the, you know, honestly, reduced row echelon form for a matrix when you're solving it over the rational numbers gets pretty hairy pretty quickly because mm -hmm. fractions pop up a lot, mm -hmm. right? Um, and as soon as fractions pop up, they tend to perpetuate and they tend to get worse. Uh, the more that you, more row operations that you have to do. Um, fortunately for us, modular arithmetic doesn't have fractions. I mean, it does, but every fraction in a in a modular ring can be expressed, re-expressed as just another integer. Mm -hmm. right? um, so at least. Fractions aren't going to be our concern. Our concern is going to be keeping track of how to do arithmetic, how to do addition and multiplication mod 3. Um, so let's, for example, um, in, in the process of row reduction, or sometimes called Gaussian reduction or Gaussian elimination, there are three different operations we can do. What are those three operations? Three elementary row operations is what we call them in linear algebra. Start with an easy one. If it's if it's necessary or if it's advantageous, we can swap one row with another row, because all that's doing is trading places for which equation is which. It's not going to change the actual solution. Right? Um, so if we need to, we can swap rows. Not the most interesting row operation. Um, the second operation we can do is we can add two rows together and replace one of them with the sum. So add two rows uh, and replace. So we can replace any row with its sum with any other row. Because okay? that's really just taking two equations, both of which are satisfied by our solution, if it exists, and just adding them together into a new equation that also must be satisfied by our solution, if it exists. Uh, so I can add two rows and replace one of them with that sum. And the third thing that I can do is I can multiply a row by a constant and replace that row with the multiple, right? um, which is just the same thing as taking any of the equations represented by that row and just multiplying both sides of that equation by the constant. Right? So that's not going to change the solutions uh, that that has. And every, every, um, every solution to a linear system of equations is unchanged by these three elementary row operations. These are like the Reitermeister moves, really, for, for, uh, for row operations on a matrix. They leave the solution set of that linear system invariant. Um, and what's the goal? What does reduced row echelon form look like? Trying to get the identity matrix. Ideally, we would like to get something that looks as close to the identity matrix as possible. So try to get identity matrix. And then what characterizes the identity matrix um, is that we want to have zeros uh, underneath the matrix's diagonal. zeros under the diagonal as much as possible. And also, we want ones on the diagonal as much as possible. And a matrix which has all zeros under and all ones on the diagonal will be reducible to the identity matrix. Um, but what's interesting about linear algebra is that that's not always possible for a given matrix to always get all ones on the diagonal and all zeros everywhere else. Right? Um, but there are a lot of systems where that's just not feasible. And so our goal. The, the, the part of it to focus in on the most, I think, is this one. Get as many zeros underneath the diagonal as possible. And to be clear, the diagonal refers to um, the entries in the matrix which start at the upper leftmost and then continue 
in the, the, exactly the northwest to southeasterly direction, right? So and it's not really showing up on the screen very well, uh, but it's this line going back. So I want all the entries underneath here to be made zero. Um, and once that happens, I can then also try to get all the entries above the diagonal to be made zero as well. So let's, let's try that process. Um, and we're going to do so using, uh, using arithmetic mod 3. So just so that we have a crib sheet for ourselves, uh, we can come up with an addition table for addition mod 3. All right. So with our addition table in hand, let's maybe look below the diagonal of this matrix and maybe in the first column focus on one of the entries and try and get that first non-zero entry that we find, which I'm finding right here, focus in on that and try to make that equal to zero. Um, so how I can clear out that entry and make it zero is I can try taking the rows below it and adding those rows into it to try and make it into zero. So what happens if I, I'm going to add my E row row E. I'm going to add it together with row D. So that's, that's row operation number two, right? Add the two rows together and replace one of the rows by the sum. Um, so I'm just going to replace every entry in this D row by the sum of what was there added to what's below it. So 1 plus 1 is going to be 2. So not 0, but 2. That's OK. We'll patch that up in a minute. 0 plus 0 is going to give me 0. 1 plus 1 here is going to give me 2. Um, and then I've got 1 plus 0. That's going to stay 1. 0 plus 0 is going to stay 0. 0 plus 1 is going to take me to 1 in this entry. And 0 plus 0 on the right-hand side remains the same. So I haven't gotten the 0 that I was looking for, but I will. If I add row E one more time. That's why I say we can get away, probably, without multiplying rows. We can just add rows enough times uh, that's going to get us back around to 0. Because now, 2 plus 1 is going to give me 0. And I got the 0 I was looking for. 0 plus 0 is 0. Uh, 2 plus 1 here is also going to give me another 0. So we actually got 2 for the price of 1 there. Um, 1 plus 0 is 1. 0 plus 0 is 0. 1 plus 1 over here is going to give me 2. But now I've got the 0 that I was looking for. And then I might next focus on the one that I have here, um, which it looks like uh, I can't really do much with unless I were to maybe try adding row E, adding some copies of row A in to eliminate this 0 down here, or eliminate this 1 down here in row E. Um, and if we continue this process long enough, uh, eventually we can clear out all of the 1s and if there were twos, we would clear out all the twos underneath the diagonal. Once we've cleared out all of the entries underneath the diagonal, um, at that point, we should be able to tell uh, what the reduced row echelon form of this matrix will look like. Um, let me invite you to just get a little bit of practice with this modular arithmetic um, by taking the next few minutes and trying to clear out the remaining four ones um, that, are, that are underneath the diagonal here, um, and then see what happens at the end of that process. To clarify, the row operations that are valid in linear algebra are multiplication by a non-zero constant. And so multiplying a row by 3, That's mod zero, 3, is the same zero. as multiplying by 0, right? That's Otherwise, we could get as many zeros as we want in my matrix just by multiplying the rows by 0. Right. Um, but then that loses information. I, uh, I forget some of the intricacies of uh, matrix operations. Yes, as you, as you do when you don't work with matrices very often. Um, so at least it, it gives us an algorithm, at least, to figure out um, uh, how to get this matrix into its reduced row echelon form. Um, but let's use technology to, to bootstrap our way uh, up into it. We need technology that can do linear algebra, but can do it over a modular arithmetic system. Um, and that technology um, is Probably better, the, probably the best version is any computer algebra system. So if you've used Maple or Mathematica or one of those types of programs as part of your undergrad program here at Bridgewater, um, those are good examples if you still have access to that software. 
But a better example for us, since we're playing the, uh, the open education game, uh, is the open, open source computer algebra system called Sage. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with Sage. Um, so this semester is actually my first time experimenting around with it. Um, but it is, it is legitimately an open source computer algebra system uh, that can be used to do a lot of the same kind of stuff that Maple, Mathematica, and that kind of stuff does. Um, the drawback to it is that it works primarily through text-based command line interfaces. Right? So we have to learn a little bit of syntax uh, for how to, how to build uh, Sage. Um, but what's cool about it is it's open source. You can just jump into a browser, uh, go to sagecell.sagemath.org, and it gives you an interface with a Sage server. And you can just type in commands, and it performs the commands for you. Um, I'm also able to embed Sage cells inside of our live textbook uh, here on, on my website. So I just put this one on our, our class outlines page for today. Um, so what I'm doing in this Sage cell is I'm declaring what's called a matrix space. So it tells Sage that I want to create a set of matrices, and those matrices are six by six matrices, since I'm going to do this for the, 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 the not 6-2 that we're just working on. Um, and I am able to tell it that I want it to work over the integers mod 3 with this part of the declaration. So matrix space, integer mod ring 3, 6-6. Six, six. So the 6 is telling the dimension of the matrix. Then all I have to do is declare the matrix itself that I'm interested in working with. Um, and for that, I put all the entries of the matrix inside square brackets um, separated by commas. So listing them by rows, here's the first row, here's the second row, third row, fourth row, and so forth. Um, so here's what that whole row looks like. I can't see it because it scrolls off the edge over here. Actually, maybe I can. Can I expand this cell? I think that's a little flaky. Yeah, it doesn't work the way I'd like it to. Um, and so once, once I've declared that matrix on the second line, um, then what I like to do is ask Sage to first of all print out the matrix so that I can just double check it and make sure that uh, it is what I wanted it to be. And then the command we want is the echelon form command. Uh, so you can invoke that by um, using a dot on A, so A dot echelon form, and then parentheses. Um, when I embed Sage in a web page or when you use a Sage cell, it'll just have a button here that says evaluate. Knock on that button and it will run the Sage code you'd give it in that cell. Um, oops, and I, what I didn't do is I didn't tell it to give me a space in between my, my matrix A and my echelon form matrix. So it's kind of smushed all of it together. Uh, let me help out Sage here and draw a horizontal line. So here is, what we're seeing is the matrix itself on top that I'm calling A. This was the matrix which, so on top is the matrix A uh, and on the bottom, is the row echelon form for uh, the matrix A. So this is the, this is the result of applying those elementary row operations to the matrix A as much as possible to get as many zeros below the diagonal as possible and as well as as many zeros above the diagonal as possible. Um, and so what do you notice about the row echelon form of this matrix? Each of the first five rows in my row echelon form uh, are giving me an equation that relates only two of the colors together. Uh, one of them with a coefficient of one, the other one with a coefficient of two. So that kind of resembles that x plus two y uh, uh, equation that we were looking at before. What does that sixth row tell me? It's kind of the same thing, isn't it? Like x6 plus two x6. Uh, yeah, well, except that the coefficients of those x6s are actually oh, zero. Yeah. yeah, but in mod three, mod would three. that be three x6? Sure. Uh, but that's always going to be the case no matter what x6 is. Yeah, if, you know, you're right. x6 plus 2x6 is going to be the same thing on the one hand as 3x6, but that's the same thing as 0 mod 3. So that's actually always going to be the case no matter what x6 is. So you're right, but too clever by half in a way. <laughs> because really, this last equation has very little information content. It doesn't tell us anything about the values of the variables x1 through x6. All it tells us is that 0 is congruent with 0, which is always true. So this third equation is going to be true regardless of what values we pick for x1, x2, x3, regardless of how we color the six arcs of this knot. The sixth equation is going to be true. What do equations 1 through 5 tell me? First of all, if I want to know the value of x1, what do I need to supply? I need to supply an x6. If I tell you what x6 is, you can use this first equation to tell me what x1 is. 
Likewise, for the second equation, if you tell me what x6 is, I can tell you x2. Third equation tells me x3 can be determined by x6. x4 can be determined by x6. x5 can be determined by x6. So what determines x6? Nothing. We do. So remembering back to linear algebra, what we notice is that each of the columns in these matrices correspond to one of the variables. Right? First column is x1, second column is x2, etc. And somehow the sixth column here is different than the first five. The sixth column does not have a one on the diagonal right here. It has a zero. And so what that tells me in linear algebra language, we call that column the variable that it corresponds to, we call a free variable. It means we get to choose the value of that variable freely. So you get to pick x6. But once you pick x6, all the other variables, x1 through x5, are all determined by x6. So those variables are not free. We don't get to choose whatever we want for x1 through x5. Those are going to be determined by the value of x6. So we call those determined or bound or defined variables. I like bound. x1 through x5 are all bound. And so the scheme here, if I want to determine a solution for this linear system, is that I get to choose x6 however I like, but then I use that value to determine x1 up through x5. Moreover, let's be more explicit about what that looks like. Let's solve each one of these equations here for x1 through x5. I can do that by subtracting 2x6 from both sides. But what's negative 2 mod 3? It's 1. So I could also just add 1x6 to both sides of these five equations. So let's add 1x6 to both sides of each of these five equations. It's going to remove my x6s from the left side, and it's going to reintroduce them on the right side. x6, x6. So once I choose a value for x6, what values do x1 through x5 have? The same value as we chose for x6. So how we come up with a coloration for this knot is to choose the color of the sixth arc. It can be any color we like. We have three choices, 0, 1, or 2. But then once I choose x6, then we are forced to make all of the other arcs the same color as that one. Yes. Right. Great. So coming back to our diagram. So coming back to our diagram, what it's telling me is that I get to choose how I color this one arc. And I can choose how to do it in any way I like. I can make it red. Let's make it red. Right. Zero. But as soon as I choose the color for that arc, the color of every other arc in this diagram has to be the same. And so the only way to use my box of three crayons to come up with a valid coloration for 6-2 is to color all six of the arcs exactly the same. So what does that mean about the tricolorability of 6-2? We can't do it in any interesting way. And this is now an airtight proof of it, using the principles of linear algebra. Any way that exists to tricolor this knot, 6-2, is exactly going to be a solution of this linear system of equations. But the only, the only solutions of this linear system of equations are those in which all the colors are equal. And so we say that this knot is not three-colorable in any interesting way. It's only trivially three-colorable. The only way to do it is to use the same color for all six arcs. And that now is something that's super powerful, right? Because we now have a way of determining the tricolorability by transforming it into a linear algebra question and then using the tools of linear algebra to figure out how many solutions the system has. And the magic equation is all that we need. Just write down the magic equation at each one of your crossings and then feed that system of linear equations into some linear algebra solver that can do that solution mod 3. And then the solution to that should tell you 
what you're up against. In this case, the answer is not much. We can't tricolor this knot. 